Hi, my name is Robert Burns. I'm a technical leader within Cisco Services supporting ACI. Today we're going to give you an overview showing you how to deploy ACI vPod uh, from scratch with version 4.0. Uh, high level agenda will include uh, giving you a quick overview of my lab topology, what I'll be doing today, and then the various steps to deploy vPod. So there's a number of steps and we'll kind of separate them here just so you can kind of skip through and look at each section as they're pertaining to you if you need help. Um, they include essentially installing or updating your VC plugin, uh, which allows us to manage the, uh, the vPod infrastructure and deploying the AVE. We'll have to also configure the IPN device. So this is a step that is a little above and beyond what ACI will control. So the IPN configuration is a separately managed device um, outside of the scope of ACI. So we'll take you through what needs to happen on your IPN device. Next, we'll configure the AVE domain that will be used for the vPod. This can also be done during the vPod deployment, but we recommend that you pre-create the AVE domain to take advantage of all the configuration options that are available by creating a, an AVE domain in the typical format. Next, we'll configure the ACI fabric to connect to the IPN device followed by deploying your vPod management cluster, which consists of a pair of virtual spines and virtual leaves on ESX bare metal. Next, we'll deploy the AVE on our uh, ESX hosts that are gonna have all of our endpoints running on them. And then lastly, we'll connect our endpoints to the AVE. So from here, we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so let's take a look at our topology for our vPod deployment. Um, so in my lab here, this is what a typical um, a typical fabric would look like on the left side here. I've got my seed pod or your prim primary fabric. Um, nothing too special about it. Left a lot of the default options here for uh, the various settings. Um, now typically what would happen in a vPod or an, a, even a multi-pod environment is that in your first site or your pod one, you're gonna typically have a couple of IPN routers uh, those would connect to your spines and then those would go across and connect to your remote location either in the same data center or cloud or remote site depending on how yours is set up. Um, but as long as we have kind of IP connectivity between the pods that's really what we're looking for. So most customers will have a pair of redundant um, IPN routers in each pod or each site and that's how they will use their connectivity. Now between the IPN routers um, within that network there. It doesn't matter what we use in the back end if we're using you know MPLS, OSPF, BGP, doesn't matter. But the only thing that we have a requirement on is that between the spines and the IPN routers and the V spines and the IPN routers is that we do have to use OSPF. But typically this is how a topology would look like. Now I've got a, a vCenter server appliance that is on a management network that is connected to ACI, doesn't have to be, as long as your hosts and your Apex can all reach the vCenter, um, that's pretty much all you need. But this vCenter is, again, a single vCenter. It does happen to live within my pod, and it could be external to your pod, it does not matter. But the ESX hosts that are gonna host my vSpine and vLeafs do have um, reachability to the vCenter, and those ESX hosts are managed by this vCenter. And what's gonna happen is we're gonna end up pushing a AV instance to this vCenter, and that's where our AV deployment for the vPod use will come into play. Now in my lab is a little bit differently here, so if I just kind of switch up, um, this is kind of your sample topology, but in reality, I don't have as much equipment, so this is what my IPN is gonna look like. So I actually have just a single IPN device. I'm using a Nexus uh, 9300 for this where my spines do connect directly to it, as well as my vPod ESX host connect directly to my IPN. So again, this is just a way to do kind of a lab workaround because I don't have all the extra uh, layer three switches to do all the IPN connectivity, but this will accomplish the exact same result at the end of the day. So from here, we will go ahead and start doing our configuration. Okay, so I'm going to show you how now to update or install your vCenter plugin. Um, on my particular fabric here, um, I'm running 4.0.0.253C. Now you might be running a different version um, in your environment, but that's perfectly fine. Don't worry if the versions don't match up. 
in uh, my existing right now in my vCenter plugin here, if I go into vCenter, I do have the plugin already installed, so I've already kind of navigated to ACI Fabric, which brings me here, and I can see that my plugin version is 40234.7. And what I'm looking for is to make sure that matches with what's currently shipped with your APIC. So if I go to my APIC IP uh, forward slash VC plugin, here I'm going to see which plugins were shipped. So I should be running, or I want to be upgrading to this 253.3 version here. So I'm going to change mine or upgrade mine to that appropriate version. Now, if you've never installed the VC plugin, you don't really have to worry about that. Um, but because I did have a previous version, we just got to make sure we upgrade. So what I'm going to do first is get this installation script and just save it to my desktop or my local workstation here. And I'll just throw it into my C drive, keep it nice and simple. All right. Make sure that installed or that downloaded. And I'm just going to throw it onto my C drive just to make it easy to get to. Okay. Oops, that's the plugin. I actually want the script. So let me grab the script. The plugin you can leave hosted on your APIC because we're going to go ahead and um, we're going to uh, install that right directly from the APIC. So again, I'll just save that onto my C drive. Now, assuming you've got PowerShell installed, go ahead and launch PowerShell. I've already got VMware modules installed, so if you don't have the VMware module, um, you can read instructions on the web how to install that. So I'm just going to go navigate to where my where my dude is. There he is. That's the script I want to run. So I'm going to go ahead and launch that script. First thing I need to do is enter the uh, vCenter IP. Now I need the path to the plugin. So again, I'm keeping it on my APEC. I'm just going to snag the URL location because we're going to install this directly into PowerShell. Okay, so there's the plugin path, which is my APEC IP, forward slash VC plugin, and then the path to the file itself. And we'll go ahead and install that. So nothing, next thing it wants here is the HTTPS uh, thumbprint. I'm using HTTP on my lab environment here, but you could be using HTTPS. If you did that, you would need the SH1 uh, thumbprint. Uh, to get that, pretty straightforward, I would just go to my Apex IP. And you got to make sure you're going with HTTPS, so I'll just change that. And then once you get to there, you can go ahead and view the certificate details. Now let's just add this guy to my exception list. Okay, so once it loads up here, and again, this is only if you're using HTTPS. more information and here you can view the certificate and here would be my SH1 fingerprint so I would just copy and paste this into that PowerShell uh, script here but again I'm not using HTTPS right now so I'm just going to keep it very simple here so I'll just jump back over to my PowerShell script and because the only other thing to consider is if you're using HTTP like I am, you've got to make sure that on the vCenter server side, you've enabled the yeah, allow HTTP um, flag on the web client. So it's one of the config properties in the file here. Again, you can find this out very easily online, but it's you've got to essentially allow the VC plugin to be installed over HTTP, otherwise it'll fail. Okay, so I have no thumbprint here, so I'm just going to go ahead and hit enter. Okay, now it's going to come up here and prompt me for my vCenter credentials in a second. Okay, so I'll go ahead and put in my vCenter administrator account. And if it's successful, I should get a connect successful message here in a second. Okay, we're connected and it did the update. So I can see here it upgraded the plugin version to 40253.3. So everything looked good there. 
Um, I have seen some issues where this may succeed, but you may not see the plugin installed on the vCenter client. And what that means is that we've registered the information to the vCenter, but the plugin itself doesn't actually get loaded into the web UI until you log in. So it's like a runtime load here. So even though this may be successful, if you don't see it um, appearing inside of your vCenter client here, uh, that could signify either a problem with, you know, maybe it can't access the plugin off the HTTP server. Um, so you just got to kind of troubleshoot basic connectivity and we've got some documentation that supports that. So now that I've done this, I'm going to go ahead and log out because I need to update this. So I'm just going to log out of my session here. And once we're all done, I'll go ahead and log back in. And it may take some time to load uh, the first load, so give it some time to do its thing here. Once your client does completely load here, then we're going to just go back to where the plugin was loaded and just confirm on the version. So we bring up the ACI plugin and we go to about and we're still showing T34G here. So at this point, the only other thing I would suggest we do is to restart the vCenter web client um, service here. So we'll go ahead and do that here now. I'm just going to log back out here and this does uh, get required sometimes here. So let's go ahead and log out. And I'm going to go ahead and get connected to the vCenter server. So I'm logging in directly to it. I'm going to have to log in with uh, the root account. So if we know your root password. And hopefully don't fat finger it a couple times like I did. Uh, next thing we're going to do, we got to launch the shell. Okay, and from here now, we're just going to restart the vCenter web client. So service dash control stop vSphere client. And we're going to also do another start after that's going to be complete. So I'm just going to add a double command here control start vSphere dash client. Okay, so let that do its thing here. Now this will take a sec because it's going to restart the uh, the daemons on the VCSA appliance here. This may take a second, uh, so I'm just going to pause it here while it finishes. Uh, and through the magic of editing, uh, we'll come back when it's all complete. So the stop to finish completely. Now we're just restarting the service here. So give it another second or so. Now even above and beyond when this says it's started, it still may take some time for the UI to come up. So again, just be patient. It may take like five or six minutes. So once uh, from the point this says it's completed, I'll usually wait, uh, go grab a coffee, whatever, come back. And then by that time, the UI will be ready to load. We can log back in and test it out here. Okay, so we're all done there. We're going to go ahead and uh, exit out of here now. And we'll close off of our SSJ session. Now, before I do this, if I try to log right in, it's going to say the web client is you know initializing. So again, give it about five or six minutes here. So I'll do a quick pause here and come back when that's been complete. Now the nice thing with this, if you leave it on that page where it says the web server is initializing, it will eventually load up when it's ready to go here. So we'll go ahead and get logged in here and give it a sec to load up. Okay, still loading up here. And if you find that this happens to still fail, you may want to reboot your uh, vCenter server appliance just to be sure it clears out any anything else. Um, I've also seen issues where you have to clear your browser cache or offline content as well to clarify this. So assuming everything went well, we'll go back and log into the ACI fabric and you can see it's no longer showing out. Oh, sorry, here it is. And uh, the version it should show us now should be our new 253 version. So let's go over here. Okay, perfect. So that's the new 253 version. So that's essentially the first thing we have to do there. We've got that upgraded. Um, now we can go ahead with the next uh, steps, which will be um, you know, working on some of the other things, including the IPN and then the ACI config. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and start configuring our IPN. Um, looking again at our topology here, I'm gonna have three interfaces going to spines. Now, in my lab here, I just have single interfaces going up to my IPN. Now, these could be redundant if you had multiple IPN devices. 
Uh, for simplicity of my lab, I just have a single link between each spine and my IPN. And then on the other side over here, where my ESX hosts reside, is actually on a UCS uh, B-Series chassis. Um, and those guys are going to have their uplinks coming to the IPN as well here. So we'll take a look at all that now as we go ahead and set that up. So here's my IPN device. Um, it's pretty simple. It's a 9232C. Um, I'm going to. It's pretty much a you know not too much turned on right now. So this is a very very fresh install. So you'll see me doing pretty much everything from scratch here. Um, so the first couple things we're going to need here. Um, show feature. I don't really have anything turned on that I need yet. So there's a couple things that we want to highlight here. We want to make sure we've got turned on. Um, one of the first ones is we're going to need uh, DHCP. So we need the DHCP relay. Um, that's going to be a feature we're going to need to turn on. We're also going to need OSPF because that is what is supported, uh, which is way up here. So we'll turn on OSPF. Um, that's going to be required again to set up the sub interface links between our IPN and our uh, spines and vpods um, and then the only other thing we're going to need is the interface vlan because i'm doing something like i said a little bit different i'm going to be using um, my ipn device as my gateway uh, i'm not going to be splitting this up here so i'm going to create my gateway for my vpod virtually virtual spine is actually going to exist on my ipn now typically that would exist somewhere else in your network which would then uplink uh, or be routed to the ipn but in my instance here, like we showed, uh, everything exists in my lab here. So I will just have a, uh, I'll have an SVI over here set up with my gateway for these devices over here. Okay, so let's go ahead and turn on these features that I need. So let's go feature OSPF, turn that on, feature DHCP, and lastly feature interface VLAN. Okay, now I've got some things already turned on like LLDP and I've actually gone ahead and labeled the interfaces that I'm going to be using. So if I just go show LLDP neighbor, here are the devices. So my UCS mini is connected to a breakout cable on port 1. So port 111 and 112 go to ETH A, uh, Fabric A, Fabric B respectfully on the UCS chassis. And that's where my virtual spines will be hosted. Okay, That's where my ESX is installed on the bare metal blades. Um, then I also have here my three spines on ports 12, 13 and 14. And I can also see the respective uh, remote interfaces as well, which is important. Okay, so let's go ahead and go ahead and configure a few things here. So first thing we're going to do here is we're going to start configuring uh, a, um, a VRF because I want everything in here um, to kind of be separate. And in labs, it's common to um, split things up on a switch depending on the you know the type of workload. So I've got a managed VRF, but I'm going to separate one as well for my um, for my VPod stuff. So I'm going to call VPod. Okay. Um, that's pretty much it for the VRF. It's quite simple with that. Um, next thing I'll do is I'll start off with my IPN devices. So I'm going to start off with ports uh, 1 slash 2, 1 slash 3, 1 slash 4. These are my three spine facing interfaces. So if I just go show run int e1, 2 to 4. All I really did was label them. I haven't done anything else. And the first thing I'm going to want to do is to jack up the MTU. So with the MTU, consideration needs to be made that anywhere within the fabric we're going to slap on an additional 50 bytes for VXLAN header to go across the IPN. So I typically will increase my MTU to the largest possible in the IPN. That way uh, on my host level as long as they're not uh, generating a packet that's you know I'd say beyond 9,000 bytes uh, I'm going to be fine for anything that we're going to send. So let's go ahead and do that first. So we'll go int eth 1, 2 to 4 and we'll set the MTU to be 92.16. And that's pretty much it for the parent interfaces. Now, as we know, hopefully, the way we connect to the IPN is through sub-interface VLAN 4. That's what we need to use. So we're going to need VLAN 4 created. Um, this is going to be important. So we're going to call this uh, name ACI Infra. Because that's going to be the sub-interface uh, VLAN that we're going to use for encapsulation. And that's hard-coded on the on the ACI and the APIC software. So we're only going to use VLAN 4 when we're connecting our spines to our IPN. 
So let's start off with the first one. We'll go int e one slash two dot four. Let me create the subinterface. Um, if you wanted to give it a description, you know you could do so. I'm just going to kind of copy mine here. Okay. Um, next thing we're going to do is start configuring all the relative things we need here. So let's go ahead and jack up the MTU. Uh, I'm going to set up the encapsulation. And we're using VLAN 4, as I said. I want to make this part of my VRF for VPOD. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And do that first before you assign any IP addressing. Otherwise, we're going to delete all that information. Okay. So here's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to assign my point-to-point my -point links for OSPF. And I'm going to use... Uh, a very simple addressing scheme. I'm going to use dot one on this side, dot two on the spine side, dot five on this side, dot six on the other side, and so forth. So pretty straightforward with the addressing scheme. Um, I'm going to use network type point to point, and then lastly, um, I'm also going to enable um, MTU ignore. If you're you know very sure about matching up your MTU, this won't be a problem, but if you do have an MTU mismatch, we're going to not be able to bring up a OSPF. So I just kind of, in my lab environment here, I just turn this on to make things simple. Um, now, I haven't actually created the uh, OSPF instance yet, so let's go ahead and do that. So I'm just going to unshut this interface, and I'm going to whip down, and then we're going to go ahead and create the OSPF uh, instance for this as well. So let's go router OSPF, and I'm just going to call it vpod, going to keep it simple. And I'm going to put it in the VRF. And then I'm just going to give it a router ID um, of 1000. Um, so my router IDs will be 1000 for the IPN. My spines will be 1001, 1002, 1003, just to designate that they're in the site one. Okay, so now that I've got the OSPF instance, let's go back to that interface. And. Uh, okay, let's go. NTE1 slash 2.4. And we're just going to add the OSPF configuration here. So IP router, OSPF, VPOD. And then my area, and I'm just going to use area zero. Yeah, probably not a best practice. You could use area one if you wanted to. It's not a big deal. Um, but just to keep things here simple, I'm going to use area zero. Okay, so that's pretty much it there. So I just got to repeat the process now for my other interfaces. So I'm going to go ahead and do 3.4, and then pretty much do the same things there. So we'll go uh, description. I'm just going to kind of copy this guy here. This is my spine 2. MTU 9216. And cap.q4. Uh, VRF member VPOD. IP address 1.1.1.5 slash 30. OSPF network point to point, uh, IP OSPF MTU ignore, and then we'll do our router OSPF VPOD area oh, let's get this right here, IP router OSPF vpod area zero and then just a no shut all right and last time here we'll just spin up and do our last sub interface for spine number three pretty much you can replay your commands and make it a little bit quicker if you want to spine three into u9216 and let's just go ahead and bop through all these nice and quick Encapsulation.4. And let's do VRF VPOD, IP address. And I'm going to use 9 and 10 for this point to point link. IP OSPF network point to point, IP OSPF 
MTU ignore and IP router OSPF VPOD area zero and no shut. Okay, so let's just double check our work there. Show run int e one slash two dot four to now well, let's just go two to four and we'll get all the subinterfaces there. Okay, so I've got my encapsulation, my IP address, MTU, and then the same um, OSPF interface there. Okay, same thing, comparing the next one down, looks good. And the last one here, I gotta do the last one here. So int e1 slash 4.4, and we're gonna cheat a little bit here and just get this description in quickly, and then we're just gonna replay the command here and make it nice and easy. This will be spline three. Play all these two. And then for the IP address, it'll have to be unique, obviously. And we'll go ahead and finish up those guys. Okay, so let's make sure it looks good again. Okay, so here's some interface one. Uh, I think I did have it right. I just. I go to five if I want to see my sub interface. Yeah, okay, thought I did it here. All good here. Don't mind making this mistake on camera. It's all part of the fun. Okay, so everything looks good here. I've got the IPN piece done. So that takes care of the IPN side uh, going to my spine switches. So let's bring up our diagram here. So all I've done here is I've now configured these interfaces here. I've got them ready to go. I haven't done the ACI config yet, so that'll happen in the next step. Now the only other thing I have to do is over here. So these interfaces that are coming in, I have to transport those on a VLAN. So I'm going to use VLAN 4, just an arbitrary VLAN that's going to terminate to my SVI. Um, this SVI is going to act as the gateway for my devices. So um, in the, my pod over here, I'm using InfraTEP 10.0.0.0 slash 16. For my VPOD 11 here, I'm going to use 11 uh, slash 16 for the addresses here. My gateway address is going to be 11 uh, zero, zero, 001. Sorry for the crude uh, writing here. And I'm just going to make it a slash 23. So that's what's going to be for my SVI. So I've got to configure that piece as well here. So let's just zip over and, and do that part. So let's just really quickly show L LDP neighbor. My two interfaces for UCS are 111 and 112. Um, and all I'm going to do on those interfaces is just attack, uh, increase the MTU. So let's go int e111 to 2. I'm going to turn up the MTU to 9216. And the only thing I'm going to do is just allow only the VLAN that I want, which is a VLAN 4. And allowed. Okay, so if I show run on those interfaces, Okay, nothing very complicated there. They're just switched interfaces. They're not uh, routed, and we're just allowing VLAN 4. Okay. Now the only other thing left again is to create that SVI interface, which I need to do. So we're going to go ahead and create that uh, interface on VLAN 4, and then the, we're going to turn on a couple other services here. So int VLAN 4. This is going to be for my my get, acting as my uh, gateway address. MTU 9216. VRF member vpod IP address 11001 slash 23 and IP router OSPF vpod area 0 and the only other thing I'm gonna need to do here is add a, a DHCP relay now I don't know the address I'm gonna be using it what's gonna happen is that when I get my DHCP requests um, from my, get this out of the way here, uh, from my virtual spine, virtual leaves, they're going to come through here, come down, and then target my APIC for an address. Now we're not going to advertise the APIC address into the IPN, which you know is in this instance is going to be 10.0.0.1. I don't want to advertise those addresses in my IPN, so we actually use a NAT. So there's going to be a NAT created, um, and that's what's called a routable subnet. 
So when I do the vpod config um, on the APIC, it's going to actually create a NAT address on my spines. It'll say, okay, your 10.0.0.1 address gets NATed to, and then it'll pull an address from my NAT, my uh, readable subnet that I'm going to define when I set up the vpod piece on, on the APIC. So that address, I'll have to come back here and add that piece, which I'll, I'll do that a little bit later here. Okay. Now, in order to do that, the only other thing I'm going to want to do here is uh, enable a couple of addition, additional uh, features here. So IP DHCP relay, if I want to be able to do that. And I think that was pretty much it. We're just going to turn on DHCP. And I think that should be take care of everything here. So let's take a quick look here. Okay, so I've got my feature OSPF, interface VLAN, DHCP, DHCP IP relay, DHCP relay. Uh, that looks good. My addresses all looks good. And then my OSPF instance looks good here. Okay, so we're going to leave that there for now. We're going to stop and switch gears here. Um, we're done on this side. Again, I'll have to come back here once I get my routable address for my APIC, and I'll plug that in to my... Um, SVI, which is that int VLAN 4. So I'll be back uh, in a bit for the next step. Okay, now that we've got the IPN configured, the next step in the process will be to start deploying vPod. Uh, part of that is going to be deploying an AVE domain, and we're going to do that kind of uh, first. You can also deploy the AVE or create the VMM domain as part of the VMM uh, vpod deployment wizard but we do kind of recommend that you create the, the AVE domain first it'll just give you access to a few more of the options in the uh, create VMM domain the the version that you could do from the vpod wizard is a subset of this so if you want the, all the features available to configure your VMM domain just create it ahead of time and then when you get to the vpod wizard we can go ahead and uh, select that domain we previously created so I'm going to call my um, my domain Robert Burr AVE there are some new settings you might uh, not have seen here before. We'll let you read up on some of those, like the host availability assurance, uh, etc. Uh, we're going to keep it pretty simple. Uh, for the AEP, I've already got an AEP called UCSB AEP. Going to keep that. Now for the VLAN pool, we're going to need to create a VLAN pool for our hosts. And I'm going to call this one Robert Burr dash VMM. And we're going to give an encapsulation block. Now, there's two kinds of uh, encapsulation blocks that we can use. One which is going to be an external or wire encapsulation. That's if you wanted to do traditional uh, VLAN mode for your AVE. Um, but in my case, I'm going to be using VXLAN mode. So the only NCAP block I'm going to need will be an internal VLAN block. This will be for the private VLAN pool that the AVE will deploy for my EPGs. Everything will go with transport through my IPN over the uh, using VXLAN will be, you know, uh, tunneling all the way through, but we do still need an internal encapsulation block for this to function. So we're going to go ahead and use uh, a block here. We'll call it 2100 to 2199. Just give it a bit of range. You do need at least um, two per EPG. So if you've got 50 EPGs, you're going to want at least 100 uh, IDs in your pool. Okay. And we're going to keep that there. Make sure it stays on dynamic. It has to be dynamic so the VMM domain can allocate those VLANs. Next thing we're going to do here is we're going to um, create the VXLAN address pool. So this is something we're still going to need. So I'm going to go 225.0.0.1. And I'm going to create a pool as well. Now I've already got one created here. We'll just take a quick look at it. Uh, pretty straightforward here. I just got a range uh, 224.0.0.1 through 224.0.1.0. So quite a quite a large range there. Okay, and I need at least one of those per EPG, um, typically when we're using uh, AV for multicast mode. Okay, next thing I'm going to need to do here is uh, define my vCenter credentials. So this will be my vCSA admin account, and I'll just give it my credentials from my vCenter server. Okay, and the next thing we'll need to do is define the vCenter server itself. So nothing different than creating uh, the AVE for vPod as it was for a standalone AVE. So it's pretty much the exact same uh, process. And I'll give it an address. 
default version, um, you can leave this as is. This will use the default version, which is the highest level of the DVS version that is supported. So if all my hosts were version 6.5 and higher, then we would default to 6.5. If we have uh, ESX and vCenter 6.7, it'll default it to the version uh, 6.6. The only reason why you may want to set this is if you wanted to kind of keep the version lower, if you had to eventually add hosts that were a lower rev than, say, your vCenter. Um, but I'm going to keep mine as the default for now because all my hosts are running uh, 6.7. Um, here you're going to need the data center name. And if you had to confirm that, you could always jump over to uh, your vCenter server. Uh, and this is my data center name here. So this really has to be important to match that. So DC1 is my data center name, and I'm going to match that there. And then my credentials, I'm just going to point it to my credentials. Okay, for port channel mode, I'm going to go ahead and just set Mac pinning. Okay, that's what we support. Um, and that's pretty much it. Other than that, I'll just set up CDP, so I have visibility to looking at interface information, which is also very helpful. And we'll click Submit. Okay, now assuming everything went well, we should see that VDS being pushed to my vCenter. And I can see a bunch of port groups are created here, the virtual switch was created here. So if I take a look at the networking now, I should have my VDS created here called Robert Burr AVE. And you're gonna see there's a bunch of default port groups here. So there's a bunch of them that we didn't have previously. So we've added a external one for your VLAN mode. If you had, uh, if you're using VXLAN mode, which is in my case, we have two port groups for that, and there's two internal port groups. This is just to increase the uh, performance and scaling of the AVE. Uh, for outside interfaces, we have a new one called Outside Cloud, and that's going to be the one that we're going to use for our um, AVE uplinks. Now, if you recall, I set up my SVI on VLAN 4 in my um, on my IPN. And I'll just bring that up really quickly here. And let's look at logged it back in. So this could be your gateway. It doesn't have to be on your IPN. But essentially, this is my gateway address that my, my hosts, uh, my AVE, and my uh, virtual leaves and virtual spines are going to need to reach. So this is using VLAN 4. So it's important that we tag this address. Um, if you also remember, um, I also configured int e one slash one slash one dot two. Um, these are my two interfaces going down to where my host exists, and I'm only allowing VLAN four. So in that case, when I'm coming to my outside interface, I want to be able to tag this traffic with VLAN four here. Now this is something we have to do manually here. So I'm going to modify the settings of the port group, and I'm just going to set the tagging on this to be VLAN four, so it matches my my appropriate uplink here. And we'll set the VLAN type to be VLAN 4. Again, it doesn't have to be VLAN 4, um, but in my case, I'm just going to be using VLAN 4. Okay, I like to use VLAN 4 simply because we use the sub sub interface VLAN 4 for the IPN connectivity of the spines. I just happen to think it's uh, easy just to recycle that same VLAN between my VPod and the IPN. Okay, so we've got our AVE piece, so that part is done. Now going back over to here. Uh, next thing we're going to do is then go ahead and create the uh, VPod deployment. Our fabric and our inventory. So I can see right now um, I've got a very simple fabric. I've got three spines. There's my three spines, one, two, and three. And I've got four leaf switches. And that's pretty much it. So the best and easiest way to deploy VPod is using the wizard. Uh, there's a lot of great things we've done here. Um, and we're going to kind of walk through this step by step. So we're going to go add pod. And it's going to ask us, do you want to, you know, is it multi-pod or is it going to be virtual pod? And in our case, it's going to be virtual pod. So we'll go add virtual pod. So the first thing we have to do, because this is the first interpod uh, type of deployment I'm setting up here. I don't have multipod running yet. I don't have vpod running yet. It brings up this configure interpod connectivity. This has to be done first before we can deploy vpod. So we're going to configure. So it's going to show us what it's going to do here. The first thing we're going to do is define the connectivity between your pod one or your seed pod and the IPN. And you can see here in our graphics, we're showing that we're going to be using OSPF. Once that's done, that allows us to have our, our multi protocol BGP VPN tunnels, you know, between our, our 
seed pod and then their destination vpod. Okay. OSPF is a protocol used as underlay here, and then we'll be using tunneling on top of that. And so it pretty much just gives you a bit of an overview of what's going to happen here. So first thing we'll go ahead and go get started. So first thing we're going to do here is define the connectivity between our Fabric 1 pod and the IPN. So I'm going to put in my IDs of my spines, and I have to define the interfaces that are connected to the uh, IPN device. And if you recall here, I'll just bring up my report here, show run, uh, show LDP neighbor, and let's make this a little bit wider, easier to read. So here's my interfaces. So spines one using port 132, 164 on, two, on spine two, and spine three is using 132. So here's where I define that information, 132. And here's where I have to match up the relative information on my IPN. So on my interface is connected to this guy. Show run and E1 slash 2 slash 4. So first guy is using 1.1.1.1 slash 30. So my first interface will be dot 2. And I'm going to go ahead and line up the MTU, 9216. Now, if you had multiple interfaces for per spine, I could add them here if you wanted to add in more interfaces. In my lab, I only have a single interface, as I said, between my spine and lab. Now, I'm going to add my other two spines here as well. So I'm going to add spine 202 and do the same thing here. So this guy is 164. His address will be 1.1.1.6 slash 30. And I'll jack up his MTU, 9216. And lastly, I'll do spine 2 or 3, and that's 1 slash 32, and 1.1.1.10, and is MTU. Okay, so just again bringing this back up here to marry up the uh, config. So on the first guy, first point to point link between spine 1 and here, I'm using dot 1 and dot 2. Next guy, I'm using dot 5, dot 6. And then lastly, I'll be using for the last guy, dot nine and dot ten. Okay, go ahead and go next. So now it's going to ask us for how do we want to set up OSPF? Which area do you want to use? Now you can uncheck these use defaults, but we really try to simplify it by hiding a lot of the configuration options you don't need to configure necessarily. So if you want to uncheck this, by all means you can. If you want to change the costing or the authentication keys, you can do so. I'm going to keep it very simple here. All I'm going to do is match up my area zero, which is the one I'm happy to be using. And we have to be a regular area because that's a backbone area, so we have to be regular. And the interface policy now is uh, on ACI. Now everybody got one created called OSPF point to point. And really all this policy does is where I define my point to point and I can enable my MTU ignore just to match up. Okay, all right, and BGP again, if you wanted to def define the uh, non-default AS and change a BGP peering type or uh, passwords, you could do so. But again, I'm gonna keep mine nice and simple here and go next. So now we're gonna need um, a couple of additional things here. Here's where we're gonna have to define the external tunnel endpoint. And this is going to be my routable subnet. So we're, even though we have an internal address here 10 slash 16, uh, we have to have a external routable address that's going to go through. This will get advertised into the OSPF, into the IPN. So I'm going to use a 192.168 and we'll use 11 for pod 11 uh, dot 0 slash 24. Okay, now you can see here it automatically defined the data plane uh, TEP IP for me, so it's given me that address already. If you want to uncheck defaults, you've got a few more things we can do here. If you wanted to manually change your router IDs, you could do so. But I'm going to keep it simple here and keep that all these guys belong to the same uh, external address pool. So my router IDs really correspond to the uh, external TEP pool. So we'll keep the defaults enabled. Okay, we'll go ahead and click finish. All right, so what that's done here is it's configured all the connectivity for that um, 
the connectivity between my IPN and my pod one. So it's showing me here in a summary what it's created. We created a policy called the routed outside and L3 routed outside interface on the um, on the on the infra v infra tenant and it kind of shows you all the information here. You can kind of navigate to it if you want to see what the policy entails. Okay, pretty straightforward. It creates all the node profiles for it, etc. So this is nice to be able to come back here and just view um, all this information here. So here's all the profiles. Again, I created an AEP. We created a spine access. And you can see everything's kind of prefixed with multipod here because this is a, you know, it's it's connectivity between our fabrics and the IPN. So we, we just call it a multipod because at some point you're going to have VPod, you're going to have physical pods, and you're going to want to expand that. So this will be kind of done one time. Once this is configured, you'll never have to come back here and worry about it. Okay, we've also created a um, multipod L3 VLAN pool, and that VLAN pool is going to have just a single VLAN of VLAN 4. Okay, that's going to be that for that sub interface, and we created the domain for it and attached it. So it does a lot of the work in the background, but this gives us a nice um, kind of summary of what it's doing. Next piece now is we're going to go ahead and add the virtual pod. So now that I got my connectivity, I'm going to create the virtual pod. Now, just stopping here for a sec. Because this has configured everything uh, in terms of IPN uh, to spine connectivity, we should be able to check that on our on our IPN. So here I'm logged, still logged into my IPN here, uh, and I'm going to have a look and make sure that the I, the OSPF piece has been correctly configured and showing up. So let's go show OSPF neighbors uh, VRF VPod. And looks good. So there's my three neighbor IDs for spine one, two, and three, which were pulled from that uh, routable TEP address pool. And I can see that my OSPF is up and it's full. Now, if this didn't come up, uh, if you have some reason, you know, you can do your basic OSPF debugging. Make sure you've got MTUs that match. If you're not using ignore, make sure the addressing scheme's good. Make sure you can ping across, etc. cetera. Uh, for our case here, everything's coming up. So that piece has been correctly configured. Now the next part we're going to do here is, again, it gives us a nice overview of the VPod wizard. So if you did have v Multipod already configured and we went through that AdPod wizard, this is where you'd start off. But because we did never had that VPod configured um, or the, the pod policy for multiple pods, we had to configure that. So here we're just giving kind of a, you know, a brief overview of what we're going to be doing here. We're going to be defining the connectivity between the IPN and those hosts that are running the vpod in my case these guys are running on ucs uh, mini okay so it gives us the overview we'll go ahead and click and get started okay so it gives us some information here it tells you that we have to have a vpod tep pool it tells you how big it has to be etc so there's some good information here as well as it you're going to have the uh, default gateway and then dhcp relay pointing towards the apec so let's go ahead and define what we need here so my pod id i'm going to use pod id number 11 my TEP pool uh, has to be an ex a new TEP pool, so I'm using 10 slash 16 already. So in this guy here, I'll use 11 slash 16. Okay. Um, I don't even think we need to be that big, so we need to be bes beside a 27 and 22, so we can make this a lot smaller here. So let's just make it, uh, I'll make a slash 23. Okay. Um, now there's a uh, next one here is pool of reserved IPs. So in this TEP pool, a subset of those are going to be reserved for spines, for the gateway address itself, etc. So we typically will carve out, you know, some of these TEP pools as being reserved, so we don't allocate them to devices. So I'm going to go ahead and just do slash 29 to carve out the first kind of chunk of those, and I'll define my gateway. And again, this is going to be my address of my SVI. So coming back over here, show run and VLAN 4. Okay, this is where my boys are going to connect. So again, my TEP pool is a slash 23. This guy's gateway is going to be dot one slash 23. So again, important that we match this config up here. So the data plane TEP for that entire VPod is dot two. So again, a lot of this has already been configured for us. You can modify that, but we suggest just leaving it the same. Okay, for virtual leaves, now here's where I have to give them a node ID. So I'm going to use 1001 and 1002. 
Reason why is for my physical leaves, I use 101, 102, just to designate you know, leaf one, leaf two. So for my V pod, I'll use 1001, 1002. Similarly, for my spines, I'm going to use 2001 for my node IDs, 2002 for spine two. I'm going to leave the default writer IDs. And again, I'll use the defaults for BGP. If I did want to define a BGP peering password, you could do so. Okay. Um, now here's the vCenter domain. Now this is the step I said you can go ahead and create this um, if you wanted to. You could create one by typing stuff in. So if I started typing here, it'll give me all the options to create a domain, but it is limited. There's not every single option that we typically see. So I'm going to use the one that I've got previously created here, which has already been defined. And if you wanted to have a look at all the configuration, you could blow it out here and then kind of sift through all the various configuration pieces of it. Okay, but I'm pretty happy with this. So I'm just going to close that back down and go finish. Okay. All right, so it's giving me a summary of everything it did here. Now here's that routable address for the APEC. Now you remember I needed that DHCP address I was talking about. Um, we needed that to do that uh, right here. So let's go ahead and do that right now. So int VLAN four, and we're gonna use IP DHCP relay, and then we're gonna to have to go ahead and relay to this address. So anytime on this VLAN where we see a DHCP address coming in, we're gonna relay it to the APIC1's routable TEP address, which is 230. Yeah, let me get it right here. Eight, eleven, two thirty. Okay, so show run in VLAN four just to double check everything. Uh, his address is good. There's his relay. Looks good there. So if you wanted to see the policies that this is going to create, all the VPod policies, you can click on this and it gives me a summary. So we're going to create uh, the node profiles, the spine selectors, interface selectors, pretty much everything we're going to need here. And if you look at the naming convention we prefix a lot of the policies with the vpod um, name and number. So vpod 11, and then we have our interface policies, our selectors, policy groups, AEP, etc. So if you had to kind of see these, it's a good way to kind of see all the policies it's going to create. Okay, so back to the summary. And the only other thing we have to note here is we're going to need an APIC passphrase in order to um, add our VMM uh, the AVE and the, sorry, just the uh, V-spine and V-leaves into our fabric. So because we don't have those certificates that we would on a physical uh, device, we are going to use a passphrase. So this passphrase, again, this one only happens to be good for two minutes, but this will rotate every so often, um, and you should have enough time to use it. Now, if you can't use the, um, if this guy's, you know, expired, like mine is expired in two minutes, so I definitely won't be able to use this specific one. I can go ahead and um, retrieve a new one from over here. So if I go to my system and into system settings, and then down at the bottom right in here, we've got a pick passphrase. So here I've got one now that's good for one hour, so it should be enough time to rotate our passwords here. Um, and then we'll kind of give it some time to do that. Um, I'd give it, make sure you have at least 20 to 30 minutes, depending on how fast your uh, virtual center is able to deploy VMs. Sometimes if it's on slower storage, it may take some time. So you want to make sure your <coughs> passphrase has enough time in order to deploy those uh, virtual spines and virtual leaves here. Okay. Um, the only thing I'll really highlight here is if I go back to my fabric inventory, the other thing we've done is we've also created now the nodes at our pending registration. So we've created these four nodes here. You can see there's the node IDs I assigned. It generates a serial number and the name for us. Now you can always come back and modify these names later if you wanted to. Um, but the status will remain inactive until I go ahead and create those virtual machines on vCenter that can come back and then you know register successfully. So we'll expect those to stay here for now. Okay, At this point we're gonna leave ACI and then flip gears and go over to the vCenter. the actual virtual spine and virtual leaf images from vCenter. So I'm logged into my vCenter here. I've got a cluster I've built here having four ESX hosts, .29 through .32. 
Now I'm going to divide up my hosts. Uh, .29.30 are going to run the virtual spine and virtual leaf redundant pairs. And then I'm going to deploy the AVE on 31 and 32. And that's where all my workload and VMs will be running. Now you could combine your management uh, cluster running your virtual spine and virtual leaves along with the AV as well that is supported. We do recommend to keep it separate, but it, again, it does work and is fully supported if you did want to combine them together. So first thing I would do is I'd have to go to my content library. And if you don't have one, you'll need to create one. And I'll have to upload the two images that we need for VPod deployment. The first one is the VPod management image, and this is the virtual switch image, and this will be for the virtual spine and virtual leaf. And then I'll also need the image for the AVE. And these will need to correspond to the version of APEC and make sure that you're compatible with those before you uh, upload those. Don't mind my versioning numbers. This is pre-release code, so my versioning numbers are probably different than what you're running. But as long as they are compatible and you've confirmed that in the release notes, then you should be fine. So next thing I'll do here is I'll go to the ACI fabric where I've recently upgraded my ACI plugin. We're running the corresponding version for APEC. And I'm gonna come in here and go down to here. So if it does ask you to register a new fabric, if this is the first time you're using it, you'll have to add the fabric information here. And I'm not gonna use a certificate. I'm gonna use my admin credentials. Make sure I get my details correct. Okay, successfully written there. So now I got a bit of visibility here. I can see my fabric's fully fit. Everything looks good. There's the version. So the first part I'll have to do is go down to infrastructure, and here's where I'll be able to see both the AVE and the VPod information. So you can see here, it does detect I've already got the domain, which is already built. So we're going to leave that for now. The first part we're going to do is then deploy the VPod image. So it sees that I have these registrations of leaves, but it's saying there's no VMs found on vCenter. And that's because we haven't actually deployed the images yet. So first thing we're going to do here is I'm going to deploy my management cluster. So I'm going to deploy the virtual spawn and virtual leaf to these two hosts. It's going to pre-populate some of the information here. Make sure you're running the version that you'd like. Um, point it to your management VLAN. So this is the one that we're, I've got routable addresses that are on my management network. And it is, you know, assigning a DHCP address. So I've got a pool of addresses already assigned to this, uh, this port group. So it's going to hand out a management address to my switch and my leaf. The infra port group. So this is one that's going to be transporting uh, my VLAN 4. Okay, so I've got one already created here that's going to, you know, doing the uplink to my network. For the data stores, um, by default, it'll try and select local storage. Um, I'm going to use a shared storage in mine just because that's what I want to use. And the passphrase. So that's where I need to go here and get my passphrase from the APEC. And again, we want to make sure that we do this with enough time here. So if I go to my APEC passphrase, I still got 52 minutes. That should be more than enough time to deploy it. So I'm just going to copy that passphrase over to here, paste it in. Okay, everything looks good here and deploy. So I only have to pick the two hosts and then it's going to deploy a leaf and spine to one and another leaf and spine to the other and that would get a redundancy. Okay, so we'll give this some time here. This will take a few minutes. So we'll go ahead and uh, I'll pause the recording while this is starting to work here and I'll come back once it's uh, complete. So just looking at the progress here, I can see I've got one of my switches pairs have deployed, so these guys have deployed to uh, .29s. So if I have a quick peek back over there, I can see I've got the first guys are coming up online there, so 2001 and 1001. Those guys are on my host, my first host, and we're currently deploying the second pair of hosts here. So we'll give it a bit more time here. It's almost done. It's taking about maybe five minutes or so, uh, so far. We'll let it do its thing here because it's going to run some uh, setup scripts on those guys and then make sure they've got connectivity to deploy. And again, keep an eye on your passphrase time. So if I take a look here, I still have 46 minutes on this passphrase. Um, but once we finish here, I'll show you that if you do have a problem with the passphrase expiring, how to fix that. So I'm just going to let this guy finish uh, deploying here. We'll let it do its thing here and then we'll come back in a minute. 
Okay, so progress is going well here. We've completed uh, almost all our tasks here. We're just doing a couple residual uh, tasks at the very end of the process here. If I go back down to my ACI plugin under infrastructure, and looking under the VPOD. Okay, so my first pair is uh, you know, running on the host here, I've been allocated my antigen address. And again, that's nothing that ACI is doing. That's coming from the uh, vCenter IP pool I've defined previously on that uh, port group. So I've got a management address assigned to it. That looks good. We're still not in a fully discovered state. We're going to wait for that to finish. Um, from an ACI perspective, if I could jump over to my fabric here. Again, we're still doing a bit of tasks here, so it's going to take some time for that to complete. But underneath my fabric membership here, I should eventually see that my registry nodes here should eventually move from pending into registered. So we're going to give them some more time here to complete the process here. And then uh, we'll come back in another minute or two once everything has been uh, completed here. Give them another five minutes. I'll be right back. Okay, so I waited a few minutes here just to take uh, another look at what's going on. Um, my hosts, my vLeafs and vSpines here are still showing inactive. If I go over to my APIC, I do see that those registrations are now moved over to the registered node. So that means we've got connectivity. They've been allocated a DHCP address from our TEP pool that's assigned to the vPod. So that's good. They're still showing as inactive. And that's because we have to do a bootstrap. They're going to boot up with the appropriate uh, software and configuration. So this may take a, a little bit of time here. So again, I'll give these guys a few minutes to kind of pull down their config from the APIC and complete their process here. Okay, didn't have to take very long, a couple minutes after that here. Now I see my state is showing as active, which is great. If I look back over here, still showing as active. Let's just refresh that. These should come active, and boom, there they go. Okay, so now I've got my vplod, vpod deployed here. I've got connectivity, which is really good here. Um, next part is we'll have to deploy the AVE. Now just to show you a couple of things here, um, from a troubleshooting perspective, some things I may want to check here is I may want to make sure I'm learning the MAC addresses on my gateway device here. So if I go show uh, MAC address uh, VLAN 4, which is where I'd want to see my virtual spines and virtual leaves, I've got four addresses here. Um, if we take a look at those addresses here, those should correspond to my virtual spine and virtual leaf here. So if I kind of come down here, I'm just going to pick one at random. And let's look at leaf 1001. If I right click on this guy, look at his settings, and if I take a look at his MAC address that's coming in on VLAN 4, that's the management adapter. This is the one that's going to be his uplink to the uh, infra the VPod infrastructure. Uh, 7027. So if I kind of overlay that with where I'm looking, 7027. So there's my MAC. So at least I know my MAC addresses are getting up to my gateway. And then it would be up to the gateway to then relay those over to the uh, to the APEC. You can also look at the routing table as well. So if I go show IP route, OSPF, uh, VRF VPOD, I can see all the various uh, subnets that I'm advertising in and out of, uh, of uh, my IPN. So I can see I've got my entries for my three spine switches here. There's my 10 subnet. Here's my routable subnet. Okay, so all the addresses that I expect to see are, are there as well. Now, if I didn't know um, that routable address for the APEC, um, easy way we could figure that out here is if I log into my APEC and if I attach to one of my spines, a nice command you can use is uh, show NAT table. And this will show me the uh, NATted address from my APEC. So he's NATting 10.0.0.1 to 11.30. And again, that was just that address that I'm relaying to from on my, whoops, on my IPN. So that should always correspond to the uh, the relay address. Show run int VLAN 4. That's just this guy here. Okay. Um, so that's it for here now. <clears throat> Everything's online and active. If this wasn't active, um, there could be some problems with either reachability, um, certificates, etc. But typically, these should deploy without any issues. Um, if you don't see them come up as active, then we'll have to do some troubleshooting. 
from here now we've got to de deploy the uh, switching module which is the AVE that'll be the next step that we'll go ahead and deploy now now one more thing I wanted to show you if um, for some reason your leaves show up here but they stay in inactive state that could be because the um, passphrase may have expired it's one of the reasons that can cause a problem so if we were in let's say in the last maybe five or so minutes uh, trying to deploy one of our um, managed clusters for vpod and for whatever reason the passphrase expired and I didn't have enough time left for it to deploy this could cause a problem so if you ever had to reset the passphrase in order for them to join the cluster or join the fabric correctly um, what you could do is wait till the passphrase rolls over to get a fresh one um, copy it over so copy it and then what you could do is we could simply power off whatever leaf or if it's all of them do them all whichever leaf or spine was having the problem and you can go into the settings of that particular V leaf or V spine and within the V app options we're gonna have a property for the passphrase so here it's called vpod passphrase and I can go and edit and then I could go ahead and replace that if it hadn't yet joined the fabric so I would just come in here plunk down my current passphrase and then go ahead and OK that and then reboot your switch or power it back on and then it should be able to join the cluster so we do have logs the NGI and X logs that would show you in detail that there was a problem with the passphrase uh, but this is just showing you really quickly how you could reset that if you didn't have enough time here. Now, as I said, I've got these two guys, 29 and 30, are going to be my management cluster, running my two virtual spines and virtual leaves. And I'm going to use the 31 and 32 as my kind of endpoint, um, endpoint hosts. So I'm going to go back over to my ACI fabric under infrastructure. And I should see that everything is active still and online for my vpod. So everything's active, which is great. I'm going to jump over to the tab saying AVE. So I've already got the virtual edge domain. If you do have multiple, you'll have to select it from the drop down. And if you don't see yours, you may have to refresh the domain. But in my case, I only have one. And the first thing I'll have to do here, if I expand out my cluster here, it says not connected to the VDS or DVS. So first thing I'm going to have to do is actually connect my hosts to the distributed switch that was pushed by the APEC. So if I come over here to my Robert Burr AVE that I made in kind of one of my earlier steps, and we're going to add or manage hosts, and I'm going to add host, and I'm going to pick the two hosts which are 30 and 31. So the bottom two of my of my cluster there. And the next thing I'll have to do is decide on how to, which uplinks I want to use. <clears throat> so I'm going to go next. And I'm going to go ahead and assign the uplinks that also carry that VLAN 4. So I know that I've already configured these interfaces to carry VLAN 4 from a you know, uplink perspective. And I'm going to go ahead and assign those uplinks. So I'll put uplink 1, uplink 2 for redundancy. And then I'll do the other host as well, same thing. assigned. So what I'm left with here is I've got my two uplinks now. They're going to be assigned to the uplink of the AVE. And we'll go ahead and process through here. I've got no iSCSI interfaces and finish. So all we're doing is really connecting the uplinks to the VDS. So now they're members of that distributed switch. Coming back to the ACI plugin now under infrastructure. Now I can deploy the AVE VMs one per host. So going to expand my cluster where they're kept. So I should see that these guys are not installed. So they are connected, but they're not installed just yet. So we're going to go ahead and select both of those. Uh, pick your appropriate uh, AV Edge version, the one that you've uploaded. And again, just make sure it is compatible with the version of APIC that you're running. I select my management port group, and mine happens to be VLAN 64 which I have IPs, again, assigned that will be auto DHCP assigned to the management interface. The data store, you could use local, or I could you know, toss this onto a shared storage. This is what I'm going to use. 
We do recommend using shared storage because the AV is really not going to migrate around, so you definitely could. Um, this deploys much faster on my fiber channel storage here, so I'm just going to use that for my example. I'm going to assign it a password. Uh, I have to click off and back. Sometimes that happens here. And enter it twice to confirm. Okay. Uh, and you want to make sure you check VPOD mode, because this is going to ask me now which pod do I want to deploy to, which is my only other VPOD, VPOD 11. Okay, that's going to tie it in together so it knows that these AVEs belong to the two virtual spines and leaves that I've currently deployed here. Okay, we'll go ahead and click yes to start the process now. So it's going to go ahead and deploy those AVEs. It's going to run the setup script to assign the appropriate uh, names and attributes to those hosts. So we'll give it a minute here, and this process uh, shouldn't take very long. So it's going through here, just doing its thing. And if you want to monitor it here, I could expand uh, the cluster here. It'll tell me kind of a status of what it's doing here. These images are, are pretty small. I think they're only a couple, maybe a gig each of that. So it's going to deploy those and then power them up here. So we'll just have to wait as it takes for those to happen. So just like um, your regular AVE, when we deployed AVE in what we call enterprise mode, not in a VPOD uh, deployment, but in a regular mode, the AVE is going to create an opflex tunnel between itself and the leaf that it attaches to. So if your ESX host connected to physical leaf 1 and 2, we would have an opflex tunnel to leaf 1 and the 1 to leaf 2. In this case, what we're doing is the AVE will have an opflex tunnel but it's going to go to the virtual leaf one and virtual leaf two. So we have to make sure that the vir the AVE can reach the um, the virtual spine, or sorry, the virtual leaf uh, that we've deployed. Now again, I'm using VLAN four for my um, what I'm calling VPod infrastructure VLAN, and that's going to allow my VPod V leaves to communicate with my virtual AVE instances. Okay, so that's been completed here. So now it's just powering on those two VMs. So we'll give them a minute here. And assuming I've got free available uh, IPs in my management pool, those will deploy here. And while we're waiting here, I'll just show you really quickly where we find that information, how, where you define the, AV, the uh, VLAN pool. If I go to my data center and then over to networks, So I've got this uh, distributed switches. Okay, let me find out where they're hiding. Uh, should be under distributed port groups, and I can see I've got a network pro uh, network profile assigned to that port group here. So if we go edit settings. I don't think I define it here. Let me see if I can find where I hide that. So here's my under configure. I've got a network profile called VPod IP pool, and this just is associated to uh, VLAN 64. And within here, I've got a range of addresses that I've currently assigned. So I've got four addresses there. Uh, I skip a couple, and I've got a uh, couple, two more there, and two more here. So if you want VMware to allocate your um, IP interfaces for the management network, um, you could do so. You could also go onto the VMs and assign it manually uh, via static, but you know I prefer to kind of predefine a bunch of addresses and arrange in my, my management VLAN, and then just let vCenter allocate those to the various uh, uh, interfaces that get, get assigned there. Okay, so let's go back over and see how we're doing. And we'll go back to infrastructure. check our progress here. Hopefully they're powering on or completed to power on. Okay, so look good. I got my two management IPs here and Opflex is showing online, so that's great. Uh, if I want to kind of take a look at one of these guys here, I'm going to go ahead and just SSH to one of these guys. Well, let's go over here to 172.16.64.230. I'm 
going to sign with the admin and the password I defined when I rolled them out. Okay, so here's my first VM. So uh, if you wanted to check the status to make sure they had connectivity to the virtual spines and virtual leafs, um, you're going to do vem command show opflex cloud. Okay, and it shows that my two peer switches I'm peered with is 10.0.0.9 and 10.0.0.8. And if you wanted to confirm who those were, I could either look here. I could go ahead, and it's going to be one of the leafs here, so this is going to be dot .9 or dot .8. And if I look at his IPs, he's been assigned dot nine. So that is leaf number one, and then number two should be dot eight. And there he is. And also, if I wanted to figure this out, I could also look here as well. If I went to my APIC, I could look over and say, okay, well, here's my Fabric membership, and there's my two addresses. So that's good. We've got connectivity. Everything's active. The next step from here now would be to start pushing my port groups, or my EPGs that I want to assign to it. So I would go to one of my tenants, and let's go to a tenant, uh, go to one of my tenants, a user tenant. And I believe I've already got an EPG here. I might have already bound. Let's just check, take a look here. I got one called iperf. Okay, so no domains yet. So I'm going to add a VMM domain now, and I'm going to add them to that VMM domain. I'm going to keep everything pretty much the default here. I don't really need to change any of this here. Okay, we'll click Submit. And what that should have done is now pushed a port group to my vCenter. So if I now go and look at the port groups that are under my rubber burr AVE, I've now got my first port group. My, there's my tenant name, rubber burr local, AP1, and then iperf is the EPG name. So at this point now, I can take my my hosts here we are my two VMs, my endpoints, which are going to live on uh, 31 and 32. This guy's on 32, this guy's on 30, so I'm going to put them to 31 just to split them apart. I'm just going to migrate him there really quick. And we'll just go change compute, and I'll put them on 31. These are moving around because I've got DRS enabled, so they don't stay put. I could uh, disable that. I just haven't haven't done that. Okay, and finish. Okay, so because this guy here, he's on currently on 32, which is where I want him. I'm going to now assign his interfaces to the distributed port group that the AV is hosting. So I'm going to change this guy here. That's his first network. And I'm going to put him onto this EPG that I pushed. And I'll just make sure I connect him. OK. And then on my other guy, who was, this guy's on 32. This guy should be on 31 now, which he is. I'll do the same thing with him. And I'm going to put his interface on the iperf EPG as well. And we'll make sure he's connected. Okay. Um, these guys already have another interface with a management interface assigned to them, so I'm just going to go ahead and uh, SSH to them. Okay, so here's my, my VM running iperf. Uh, if I just do if config, so I've given him an address 1.1.1 for that first interface that's going to the EPG. And if I wanted to kind of check that out, I should be able to see him now being learned on my EPG. So coming back to the endpoints, if I go to operational and looking in here, I can see that I've got my two, my two boys there. So they're both coming in here. I can see the VXLAN ID, the multicast group they belong to, their MAC address, etc. I haven't learned any IP information because we haven't really done any communication tests yet. So those guys, um, their addresses are actually 1.1.1 and 1.1.2 respectively. And I've actually created a, a subnet within the bridge domain they're assigned to, which is uh, the gateway for the, the uh, subnet is 1.1.1.254. And I'll just kind of show you that under here. So there's my subnet that that EPG belongs to. So if I want to test connectivity now, because these guys are in different hosts, I should be able to ping 
the gateway. So if I go ping 1.1.1.254, so there's my ACI fabric. That's great. And if I wanted to ping the other guy, dot two should be the other one. So now I'm going across EPGs. So that basically concludes uh, showing the deployment of VPOD. Um, I'll probably do another follow-up video showing you a little more verification um, on the AVE, a little more deep dive, but this is really just a primer to show you how to deploy VPOD from scratch. Um, hope you enjoyed the video and thank you very much for watching.